We're thinking today on freedom that lasts. We are coming to the end of a week where our independence as a nation has been celebrated. A particular time in our nation's history where God's people are sobered and spending time before the Lord praying about uh, the state of our country, the state of our world. But this has also been an opportunity to thank the Lord for the freedom that we enjoy as citizens of the United States of America. Further, it's an occasion to reflect on God's goodness toward us historically and politically. The idea of polis is the idea of a city-state to which free men belong, and that is our experience as Americans. We have expressed thanksgiving for our national freedoms, a phrase that is used in this context is let freedom ring. And this is the idea of celebration. Uh, typically fireworks and speeches and communications regarding liberty and freedom that we are rejoicing in. Let's pray together. Father, it is our privilege to come before you and to recognize your goodness toward us. It is as well our privilege to cast our care upon you and the agitations and the rumblings of the day in which we live challenge us and cause us to need to give rigor to this exercise of casting our care upon you. Even in our time together around your word, we will be challenged with distractions, things that are on our minds, things that are on our hearts, things that are out of, out of our control, things that we would choose differently. And we would ask of you that you might quiet our hearts and you might give us a season of focus and a season of understanding and that this freedom that lasts, this spiritual liberty, liberation, emancipation that has been granted us through Christ might be brought into focus for us in a helpful way. I pray that you'd quiet my heart, many distractions in my own life and many challenges that I must give to you so that I might minister grace to these hearers. We praise you and thank you in Christ's name. Amen. As we turn to our New Testament, I'm going to ask that our attention be given initially to John chapter number 8. I'd like to take a look at a short section in John chapter 8, knowing that in just a few weeks we will be studying out this section of Scripture. It's important to be reminded that when we take up our Bibles, we take up that which was originally written in the language of the readers, of the hearers. And as you know, the New Testament was given in New Testament Greek, we would say, the common language of the day in which it was recorded. Um, this is the way in which God's truth was expressed to the reader. And so we are blessed to have linguists who study these things, who do the homework and help us to have a bit of an understanding of how someone in that day would hear what is being said. Well, John chapter 8 is more of John's record in regards to the ministry of Jesus Christ. And I want to just take time to look at verses 31 to 36 as a foundation for our thinking together this morning. I'm reading from John chapter 8, verses 31 to 36, and you will hear these terms of freedom and liberation. Verse 31 of John 8, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye 
my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. As we've seen in other places in John's record, those that were following Christ were not necessarily true disciples of Christ. And so Jesus here is communicating the reality of true disciples of Jesus Christ. They will continue in his word, and that truth, verse 32, will make them free. Well, verse 33, we get a sense of his hearers, these disciples, and he said, they, they answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. So he turns them away from their racial claims. You know, we're Abraham's seed. Why are you talking to us about bondage? We're free. Why are you talking about making us free? Well, Jesus, like he does so often in these chapters, turns their attention to what he's talking about, and that is a spiritual freedom. So he states in verse 34, Verily, verily, I say unto you, here's the truth I'm trying to get across. Whosoever committeth sin is the servant or the slave of sin. And the servant or slave abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. And he turns again and says, If the son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. They were looking for freedom in Christ in terms of political or national or racial freedom. But what Christ is speaking about is individual, spiritual, soul-level freedom. It's important for us to understand the New Testament Greek concept of freedom in the language in which this truth was given, this classical, secular language gives us a bit of an understanding of how these things would have been heard. In the communication of spiritual truth in the New Testament, we have this concept of freedom and liberty 46 times, nearly 50 times. How were the readers of John's gospel thinking about freedom living in the day which they lived? Let's think about freedom in terms of its roots. First of all, to speak of freedom is to speak of a position, the freed man, or we might say the free man. Uh, freedom speaks of a position, an individual who is free or has been freed and is now a full citizen of the polis, the city-state. This speaks of belonging and this speaks of benefit. Or benefits. To be a free man is to be part of the community of the free. Another way of stating that and thinking about that is as long as an individual belongs to the people, he is free. And that is in contrast to a slave or to a foreigner, one who is not a citizen. So, to be a freed man or to be a free man or to speak of freedom is to speak of a position. The free man, the freed man. It's also to speak of a perspective. One who has been set free. The verb is used seven times in the New Testament. We're talking now about a mindset that enjoys freedom. Somebody that's a free man or a freed man that does not understand their freedom isn't truly free. The perspective of understanding freedom has to do with a mindset that enjoys freedom. The idea, the concept would be deciding one's own affairs within that community, that polis, within that community of the free. Terms like independence and rights no, but rights within the rules of the community or the polis, that principle of order. One of the challenges of our day is a misunderstanding of freedom because freedom and law 
are not contradictory, but they're complementary. They complement one another, don't contradict one another. The way to preserve freedom is by that community to ha having laws. So freedom is preserved for all who belong because of the law of the community. So freedom in the mind of the Greeks would be a position, a freedman or free man, a perspective understanding that freedom, but also involve a practice. The idea of living free, living not bound. This speaks of privilege and responsibility. Now, some would use that living free in a negative, evil way, but most, hopefully, in that setting would think in terms of that freedom being a good thing, a way in which you are free to be a benefit to the community or be a benefit to others. One writer states the constant danger is rejection of the law in the name of a misconceived freedom, which is purely arbitrary because it is willing to grant itself more freedom than it is willing to grant to others. That's quite insightful. The practice of living free. He speaks of the constant danger, and he says there's a constant danger, and that is rejecting the law in the name of a misconceived freedom, which is purely arbitrary because it is willing to grant itself more freedom than it is willing to grant to others. So freedom was a position, a free man, a perspective of understanding that freedom and a practice of living free. In that society, in history, as well as in some of the thinking of our day was a, a stoic philosophy. Now that philosophy stated that freedom is really a disconnection from society. Asceticism is a word that we use to describe those who believe that true freedom is to disconnect from society. True freedom would require the collapse of the polis, the, the collapse of the community, the collapse of the city-state. And so a Stoic or a, an, one who is ascetic in their thinking would distance themselves from the world's reality. And in doing so, would think that they would avoid the passions and the anxieties and the pity and the fear of this perceived reality. Their thinking would be a surrender to the law and rule of the cosmos or to the gods. Their idea of freedom is a freedom from all that binds them. This idea of being detached and just living in harmony with the cosmos or the gods, that sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Well, this is found nowhere in the New Testament scriptures. The idea of our day may be termed in, in, in terms of off the grid, a complete disconnect and, and essentially trying to find some kind of passionless, detached existence. Well, alongside of that Stoic philosophy, there was the mystery religions. And their idea is that freedom comes through ecstasy, through cultic practices, cultic rites. Their idea of freedom from this hopeless world is basically the other extreme, giving way to passions. Again, that sounds very familiar. To enjoy the destiny of the deities with no rules. And what mystery religion led to was idolatry and immorality. And in our day, idolatry and immorality. We speak in terms of addictions. Addictions that silence our souls, but also addictions that enslave the participant. Well, both extremes, the Stoic philosophy and the mystery religion, Reveal the yearning of man's soul. Man yearns to be free. Man yearns for liberation. And neither of those provide a freedom that lasts because they cannot fix what is broken on the inside. So we could 
summarize that philosophy and religious practice in terms of man-made religion is impotent to change who we are, and thus it's impotent to free us, to liberate us. Freedom that lasts is known only through the God who made us, the God who knows us, the God who has provided for our deliverance, for our rescue, for our emancipation, for our liberation, for our true freedom. Freedom that lasts. Well, here's the roots, a position, a perspective, and a practice. Weaving them together, the free man, understanding his freedom and living free. Well, what interests us is the freedom and the liberty that the Scripture speaks of. How does the Scripture, how does the Bible speak of freedom? This is the groundwork before us of a secular classical Greek culture and language. What about Old Testament freedom? What happens when we turn to the Scriptures? We find that Old Testament freedom is not considered apart from the redeeming and saving acts of God. A freedom for God's people Israel meant being set free by Yahweh, by Jehovah. We are reminded that at the heart of Judaism, at the heart of Israel's celebrations and thinking, at the heart of their feast and their festivals, is being released from Egyptian bondage. This is what they talked about. This is what they celebrated. This is what they passed on to their children and their grandchildren. This is what set up their religious calendar, directed their feasting together. This Old Testament freedom is revealed in terms of national Israel being freed by God. You know the story from Exodus. There's much in that story that foreshadows and anticipates a spiritual rescue and deliverance and freedom, an emancipation, a liberation, a true freedom that is to be granted through the Lord Jesus Christ and the new covenant. But in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, freedom is focused on in terms of national Israel being freed by God. They experienced freedom as the gracious gift of covenant God. It was not naturally theirs, but it was supernaturally provided. We remember the showdown in Pharaoh's courts as Moses said, let my people go. Let my people go so they can serve Yahweh. Let my people go so they can worship Yahweh. And over and over again, God demonstrated his power. And ultimately, he rescued Israel out of that bondage. But it was not naturally theirs. It was supernaturally provided. It was not something they did for themselves. It was rather something that God did. National Israel was freed by God, and they experienced the gracious gift of covenant God. What did God do? God dealt with the enemy. God rescued them out of bondage, and God brought them into Canaan. In fact, in John 8 and verse number 33, that is their claim in response to Jesus Christ, because it says they answered him, we be Abraham's seed. They connected to the covenant God made with Abraham, and we and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Well, actually, as the seed of Abraham, they were in bondage. The testimony of the scriptures is that God, in releasing them from bondage, dealt with the enemy, rescued them out, and brought them to Canaan. So this is the testimony of Old Testament freedom. National Israel was freed by God, but secondly, national Israel belonged to God. They are a holy people. They are God's chosen people. And as you read through the Old Testament, you and I recognize that the gift of freedom remained for them to be bound to the giver, that is Yahweh. 
the gift of freedom remained bound to the giver. What does that mean? Well, practically speaking, Israel enjoyed a physical, national freedom, a liberation, emancipation. But if you read through the narrative of the Old Testament, when they detached themselves from the one that gave them that liberty, that gave them that freedom, they found themselves back in bondage. As we read the book of Judges, there is a falling away and there are repeated seasons of bondage. The enemy ruled over Israel time and time again in the book of Judges. Now, God delivered them over and over again. When they came back and repented, the giver of that freedom restored that freedom. But the testimony of Judges is that when there was a falling away and there were repeated seasons of bondage, practically speaking, even though they were God's chosen people who had been rescued out of Egyptian bondage, they were re-enslaved because of their unfaithfulness to the Lord. We're reading through the Old Testament presently, and we are watching the unfolding of a divided kingdom. The northern kingdom came into what is known as an Assyrian bondage. I think it would help us to turn back now to 2 Kings in chapter number 17. 2 Kings 17, what we're doing is we're thinking about this issue of freedom. We're trying to learn from the Old Testament narrative that foreshadows the new covenant provision of God through Christ. We're trying to watch and see what happens even with a people who are liberated and who are free. I think it gives us insight. Notice this, 2 Kings in chapter number 17. Would you follow as we begin reading in verse number 7? It says, For so it was that the children of Israel, listen to this, had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. There's that redemption. There's that emancipation and had feared other gods. And they walked in the statutes of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel, which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God, and they built them high places in their cities, from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city. And they sat them up images and groves on every hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them. It keeps referring back to that redemption and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols, whereof the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways, and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. The Lord is reminding them, I, I sent prophets to you. I sent messengers to you. I have warned you. Verse 14, notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like the neck of their fathers. They did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies, which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. Don't do that. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left by but the tribe of Judah only. Also Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes which they made. And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of the spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. For he rent Israel from the house of David 
They made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king, and Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them sin a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight. As he had said by all the servants of the prophets, so was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. What we're reading about is we're reading about the northern kingdom being taken into slavery, servanthood again, bondage again to the Assyrians because even though they were redeemed out of Egypt, they disobeyed the Lord. See, the gift of freedom remained bound to the giver, and when they departed from the Lord, he gave them over again to their bondage. Same thing happened with the southern kingdom, what we know as the Babylonian captivity. We read about that in 2 Kings chapter 21. 2 Kings 21, just a handful of verses, verses 10 through 15. This is important to us. This is a foreshadowing. This is a living testimony of what happens when men and women depart from the one who set them free. Now, this now is the southern kingdom and known as the Babylonian captivity. Just a few verses. Look at verse number 10. This is 2 Kings 21 and verse 10. And the Lord spake by his servants the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh king of Judah hath done these abominations and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols, therefore... Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears, both his ears shall tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. And I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance and deliver them into the hand of the enemies, and they shall become a prey and a spoil of all, to all their enemies. Why? Because, verse 15, they have done that which was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came forth out of Egypt, even unto this day. We have a second testimony. Now the testimony regarding, regards the second, uh, the, the southern kingdom and a second bondage. Why? Well, it's a re-enslavement because of a disconnection. A re-enslavement because of a disconnection from the one who freed them. That is from God. God gave warnings, God gave laws, God gave correctives, God insisted that they live as free men and women, and yet they return to bondage through their dishonor to the Lord. Now, the quest for freedom. Now, by the time we get to the end of the Old Testament, by the time we enter into the New Testament and begin to read of the birth and the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ, the quest for freedom for Israel had become restricted to the external political realm. To understand the background of all of the resistance that we've watched so far in the Gospel of John, to understand that is to understand that they were not looking for spiritual redemption. They were looking for an external political redemption. An earthbound, secular liberation is what they were looking for. And so, as we read the Old Testament, and we follow this emphasis of freedom in the Old Testament, it involves a national freedom for Israel as they were freed by God, but it also involved national Israel belonging to God. That is to say, positionally, they were redeemed out of Egypt, but practically, they were re-enslaved time and time and time again. And God, in his faithfulness, continued to deal with his people, and even today continues to deal with his people, Israel, because he will fulfill his covenant 
promises to them. Now that lays the groundwork and gives us a sense of an understanding of what we're dealing with when we turn to the New Testament. In our remaining time, let's think together about New Testament freedom, and we will by of necessity have to restrict ourselves because, as I've mentioned to you before, there's 46 references to freedom in the New Testament. If you'd like to note this for further reading, you might note these references. The majority of the texts that regard freedom are in Paul's writings. First of all, you might note Romans 6 through 8. We can read there and we're going to look a little bit there today. You might note as well 1 Corinthians 7 through 10. And you would like to note as well Galatians 2 through 5. The point being, when you turn to the New Testament and start thinking about this freedom that lasts, you're going to go primarily to three texts, Romans 6 through 8, 1 Corinthians 7 through 10, and Galatians 2 through 5. And you've already noted that that's a lot of material. And so our time this morning is going to, again, return us to the Gospel of John. And we just read from the Gospel of John in chapter number 8 that Jesus says in verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Now that's in the context of what's already been revealed in the first uh, seven and a half chapters. But he also says in verse number 36 of our text, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, the New Testament gives to us a clear testimony regarding freedom or liberation in Christ. Turn back, if you would, to the first five verses of John's Gospel. If we can keep these threads connected, I think we can find great benefit as we continue through the book of John. As we come to a time of celebrating national freedom, it would do us well to recognize that we may be positionally free as believers and not practically free. And that's part of what Paul is dealing with in Galatians. That's part of what Paul is dealing with in his writings in Romans and 1 Corinthians. But let's start here. Notice John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him, verse 4 says, was life. Now, that's in contrast to death. And the life was the light of men. Now, that's in contrast to darkness. Death and darkness speak of bondage. Verse 5, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. New Testament freedom, first of all, from those first five verses of John 1 and developed throughout the Gospel of John, is this truth. Freedom is available only through the self-revelation of God. Freedom is available only through the self-revelation of God. Do you understand that that's exactly what we saw in the Old Testament? That was true in Old Testament Israel's day. When you and I think of Egyptian bondage and God's rescue of Israel out of bondage, do we not also think of his self-revelation to Moses? When he visited with Moses, when he testified to Moses about who he was and because of who he was, what he was going to do, it was true in the Old Testament record that freedom is available only through the self-revelation of God. When God began to communicate how he would govern Israel, also in the book of Exodus, where did he start? He started with a self-revelation of himself. He said, I'm God, and he said, I am the God that redeemed you. The self-revelation of God, that's true in Old Testament Israel's day. That's also true in Israel's day of repatriation. When you turn over to Ezra and Nehemiah and start reading about God bringing his people back out of bondage, the testimony there is, again, a testimony that the people came face to face with who God is. They took his word, the self-revelation of God, and in responding to his word, they experienced 
new freedom, fresh freedom. They were brought back. God used them to rebuild the city, used them to rebuild the temple, used them to reinstate the sacrifices and the worship. He brought them back through a revelation of himself. If you start reading through the book of Judges, you and I read that when people came to the end of themselves and saw where they were in relationship to God and who God was, it was again through God's self-revelation that there was a testimony that freedom was available. Well, in John chapter 1, we see terms of life and light. And those are terms of emancipation. Those are terms of liberation, liberation from death. That's what life is. And liberation from darkness. That's what light is. Follow on in verse 11 and 12. John 1 verses 11 and 12. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received them, him to them gave he power to become who? Well, the word power, there's the idea of authority or the right to become who? Sons of God. What is that if it's not a testimony of liberation, even to them that believe on his name? It speaks of the Son of God, and then it speaks of sons of God, that God, through Jesus Christ, brought to us a liberation that made us the children of God. Verse number 13 says, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. He's saying to them, he's saying to Israel, he's saying to us, this wasn't through a, a physical birth. This wasn't through a racial birth. This is through spiritual birth. It's a birth of God that makes us children of God. Spirit born children of God have been liberated. They have been freed. As we make our way through the Gospel of John, we see that this involves the Father and the Son and the Spirit actively setting us free. This is a glorious testimony that, if we're not careful, we might miss as we read through, as we study through, the emphasis that John is bringing to us. Let me show you a bit of this down in verse 26. The Father and the Son and the Spirit are active in setting us free. Verse number 26 of chapter 1 of John's Gospel. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you, listen, whom you do not know. Now, here's the issue. There's someone that you must know. He it is, verse 27 says, who coming after me is preferred before me. I believe John here looks back to the reality of the eternal existence of the Son of God, that relationship within the Godhead, the one true God united in three persons. And this one that was incarnate, he is the one that's preferred before me. And John says it right in the second part of verse 27, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. John gives us this in verse 28. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So God, in setting us free, is taking away our sin. He said of him, This is he of whom I said, verse 30, After me cometh a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, am I come baptizing with water? And John bear records saying, I saw, here we go, the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the spirit descending. Now the spirit of God from the father descending upon the son of God. The testimony of the Trinity here remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. The ultimate reality is the relationship within the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Spirit relationship. And for us to be free, for us to be liberated, for us to be emancipated, we have to come into a relationship with God through the ministry of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. 
You have seen that with me in these first seven and a half chapters. Before we get to chapter number eight, in the middle of chapter eight, we see that the Father and the Son and the Spirit are active in setting us free. They're active in bringing us into a relationship with God. So faith in the unseen God revealed in Christ is what liberates us. That's the focus of John's writing. He talks about believing, 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 believing. He talks about the miracles. He talks about the works. He talks about the words. And he says, I've recorded these things that you might what? Believe. And through belief, we become the children of God. Through belief, we are liberated. Through belief, we are granted spiritual life. In chapter 3, when Jesus speaks with Nicodemus, what does he say to him? They're going to talk about the kingdom of God. And he says, except a man be born of water and, verse 5, of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He will not be liberated. He will not be set free. He will not become a child of God unless he is born from above. That's a testimony of the work of the Father and the work of the Son and the work of the Holy Spirit. The testimony of chapter number four, when Jesus offers himself as living water to the woman at the well. We come to verse number 10 of chapter four, and Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked him, of him and he would have given thee living water. Jesus down in verse 13 says, whoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. Verse 14, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. What is that? That is the liberating work of the spirit of God in the soul of man, granting life quenching the thirst, satisfying the hunger. Those are themes. Those are themes that are emphasized over and over in the ministry of Jesus Christ. We saw in chapter number six, Jesus offers himself as the living bread. Verse number 35 of John six, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. Same emphasis. I am the here to meet that need. I am here to rescue you out of spiritual bondage. And he ties together in a lengthy section in the middle of chapter number six, how he and his father and the spirit of God are all working together. He's talking on spiritual, a spiritual level in spiritual terms. And he is speaking about satisfaction, but is not that satisfaction, that liberation, that freedom from the bondage of sin, that knowing that the sin debt is paid for. As he says, God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would have what? Everlasting life. That Christ is here as a testimony of how God will redeem a people, liberate a people, emancipate a people for himself. This liberation, this soul liberation that addresses the death and the darkness, this life-giving freedom that is experienced and enjoyed by those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Freedom is granted to all who are expressing belief in God through Jesus Christ. I've worded this in such a way to remind us of what we've learned thus far, and that is we might be believers in terms of we've been born again, but we might not be believing, and that is enjoying the freedom, the liberation that is ours in Christ. Freedom is granted to all who are expressing belief in God through Jesus Christ. Now, in John chapter 8, as Jesus speaks to this, he speaks in terms of continuing in his word in verse 31. 
He speaks in terms of knowing the truth and the truth making them free in verse number 32. But then he talks about in verse 34, this slavery to sin. Notice at verse 34 of John 8, Jesus answered them, Very verily I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is what? The word is slave. He's a slave of sin. He's a slave of sin. So what is Jesus offering as he preaches, as he shares himself? He's offering himself as the one that will free from the slavery, free from the slavery of sin. Now, they didn't believe that they needed to be freed from slavery to sin. They kept claiming that they were Abraham's children. And Jesus said in verse 37 of John 8, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but you're seeking to kill me because my word hath no place in you. You are, you are refusing to believe. He came into his own and his own received him not. You are refusing to believe. You're, you're following me, but you're not trusting me. And the testimony of that is you're still enslaved to sin. And the proof of that is you're trying to take my life. You're intent upon killing me. So New Testament freedom is a freedom that's granted to all who are expressing belief in God through Christ. And that freedom is a freedom from slavery to sin. Would you look with me now at one of those chapters that I mentioned before? And that is Romans chapter 6. Now, for today, my goal is to, to chain these things together in our minds, to unite these things in our minds so that we can think in terms of this freedom that lasts, experiencing the freedom that lasts. And this freedom that comes to us through Jesus Christ is freedom from slavery to sin. What are we saying? We're saying that we're no longer in bondage to sin. We're recognizing that before Christ, we could do nothing other than sin. Our hearts were bent towards sin and our actions in life were sin. But that is no longer the case if we are in Christ. He says in verse 1 of Romans 6, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So there's the point. It's God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. A saving work, a ministry of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Therefore, verse 4, we were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life, a new way of life. What is he talking about? He's talking about freedom from sin, freedom from slavery to sin. Verse number five, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. He develops that knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, and that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not, here's our word, serve sin. For he that is dead is, notice this, our word, freed from sin, no longer slaves to sin. For if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Application, verse 11, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive through Jesus Christ our Lord. What does this look like in life? Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Obey it in the lust thereof. Don't let it be your master. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Again, a picture of emancipation, freedom, life, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. He develops it further. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. You're not slaves anymore to sin, for you're not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not 
And here's the point, that to whom we ye yield yourselves, here it is, slaves to obey, his slaves ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants, the slaves of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Now being made free from sin, ye became the what? The slaves of righteousness. He says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members slaves unto uncleanness and to iniquity and to iniquity, even so now yield your members slaves to righteousness and to holiness. For when you were the slaves of sin, you were free from unrighteousness. That's who you were. You were in bondage and slavery. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now shamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free, liberated from sin, become slaves, servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Freedom is granted to all who are expressing belief in God through Christ. What does that mean? That means freedom from slavery to sin. That also means freedom from service to Satan. If you'll look back with me at John chapter 8, you'll see that that is exactly the emphasis that we're going to be seeing in weeks to come. I'm back in John chapter 8, and I want to draw your attention now to verses 37 to 42, because the Lord continues his teaching in regards to what he's trying to get across to his hearers, these would-be disciples. Verse 37 says, I know that you're Abraham's seed, but look, you're seeking to kill me because my word hath no place in you. What's the problem? Well, I speak that which I have seen with my father, verse 38, and you, notice this, you do that which you have seen with your father. Well, they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. He's saying it's not true. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of, notice this, he turns this now and says, you're doing the deeds of your father. And then he said to them, they said to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus response, verse 42, Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me freedom from slavery to sin and freedom from service to Satan. What is the issue? The issue is who is your father, Jesus said. Paul says it this way in Romans 8, 21. He speaks of the bondage of corruption and he speaks of the glorious liberty of who? The children of of God. This deliverance is provided through new life in Jesus Christ. Freedom from slavery to sin, and freedom from service to Satan, and then freedom from a superficial existence. As Jesus goes on in our text, he continues to develop the testimony of their rejection of him being a rejection of the truth. The truth is equivalent to Christ in this passage. Let me just give you these verses in closing. Verse 43, why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You're not listening to the truth. You're not grappling with the truth I'm giving, it, giving you. What's going on here? Verse 44, you are of your father, the devil. Listen, the lust of your father you will do. What is that? That's serving sin. That's bondage. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not. 
the problem here, you're not of God. You will not embrace the truth. Jesus in John 14 says, I am the way and the truth and the life. The truth is how God communicates himself to us. It's his self-revelation. It's also how he rules our lives. Let's back up in our mind's eye. First of all, as we saw together, this freedom that lasts just from the very foundation of how the people that hear this and read this would be thinking is a position of being a free man, but also be a position, a perspective of understanding what that freedom is. Part of what we see in Romans 6 through 8 and 1 Corinthians, that passage in 1 Corinthians 7 through 10 and Galatians 2 through 5 is an is Paul, the apostle, trying to help us understand freedom in Christ, understand liberty in Christ. We're no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer servants to the flesh. We're no longer servants to death and bondage. A position as a free man, a perspective, understanding freedom and the practice of living free. For Old Testament Israel, redeemed by the grace of God, belonging to God, governed by God. That is a foreshadowing of the new covenant that we are involved with. We have, by the grace of God, been redeemed through the provision of Jesus Christ. The enemy has been defeated. We have been brought out of bondage. And now our perspective is that we belong to God. We are his people. We are sheep in Christ's pasture. And the giver of that freedom we must remain connected to in a very practical, daily, living relationship if we would have the right perspective on the freedom that is ours. And that's what Paul's trying to untangle in the New Testament. And then there is this practice of living free. We don't need to choose sin. We can live free. We're no longer enslaved to sin and this life, this liberation, this emancipation, this rescue, this deliverance is an issue of life. And it's an issue of light. And it's an issue of God's righteous rule in our lives. And Jesus Christ, the son said, if I set you free, you may know the truth and the truth shall set you free. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Let's pray. Father, in this day of celebrating freedom with much sobriety and concern, it is our heart's desire today that we would have our hearts turned toward the spiritual rescue, deliverance, redemption, freedom, liberty that is ours in Christ. Thank you that we are not laboring to earn our salvation. Thank you that we are no longer enslaved to sin. Thank you that your righteous rule has been unfolded in the New Testament scriptures. And that those of us who are living by faith are those that find true freedom, true satisfaction. We don't need to disconnect from the world. We don't need to pursue after some kind of religious activity that brings some ecstasy to our lives. But, Father, we can enjoy a relationship with the God of heaven who enjoys that perfect, ultimate reality of a relationship between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Thank you for bringing us to the place of understanding. May there be a response of repentant faith for any that do not know you and a response of resting faith from those of us that do. Have your way in our lives in these days for your own honor, for your own glory, for the exaltation of your son. Guide us through the ministry of your spirit. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.